Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the ultra-premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Bazan Cigars, Nea, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed-to-humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 256, volume 2. I am your host this week, Joe Hozempa. Co-host with me is Joe D, yeah, always baby. in the seat. Pleasure. Yeah. I have the privilege and the honor to introduce Tony Mendoza. He is a full-time soldier. He is a part-time filmmaker and an intense cigar enthusiast. Solid. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Tony had just completed his second feature film titled Life in the Hole. He's going to tell us all about this. Uh, and where you could view this uh, feature film. He's also got some projects for 2018 coming up, and we're going to talk about what it's like to enjoy cigars and be in a movie. Tony, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, gentlemen. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. Good, we're doing Tony. Well. Thank you. We're, we're, uh, we're sitting here uh, and enjoying a stick, and, and we get to speak to, to, to people who appeared in movies. I mean... You know, it's not a bad way to spend a Monday, sir. <laughs> ah, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the show and everything. And uh, I, I like we were talking about before, you know, you guys are very festive. I think I went over the top and then I saw you guys and I was like, oh, no, I'm we, we fell right in place. So we're good. <laughs> we're ready to go. We're ready to go. Very festive background right there. Hello. You are a full time soldier. Yes, yes. First this is uh First and foremost, I want to thank you on behalf of us here at Story Geeks and your staff for your sacrifice and in and, and your service. I know what it's like for the families to to go out there and and, and the, the family sacrifice and your sacrifice. And um, you know, there there is definitely not enough thanks that any of us can can give you. Thank you, so sir. I, I want to thank you and, and and especially shout out to the Story Geeks listeners for their families and all of us who are out there. What branch are you in? Um, I am right now part of the uh, Nevada Army National Guard. Mm -hmm. So I'm a full-time member of the National Guard uh, with the Army. So Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for your service. I love the festive thank background. Oh, yeah. I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's great. Well, so which one did you get into first, cigars or, or, or films? Oh, man, that's a really great question. So when I was a kid, you know, uh, 12, 13, probably even younger, we started dabbling with a camera that my my aunt let us borrow. It's the old ones that used to plug into the VCR. Oh yeah. yeah. So I, I I've always dabbled in um, those types of projects. I don't know if I'd call them films. We most uh, most of the time we just lip sync music videos and tried a few little skits and what have you. But I didn't really get into films until I got out of my first stint of the military um, in 2000, and I went to college to. Uh, figure out, hey, I got this college money. I need to do something. And a counselor started picking my mind, picking my brain, mm -hmm. and she told me about a film program. And so I thought, oh wow! So I got into it, and from there I just took off from it. So mm. take us through that journey. So you started off. What, what did you do? Like side projects first? Um, because uh, you know, from from the the little that I know about that, uh, it's extremely competitive. And it reminds me of Disneyland. Just when you think you're in the first of the line, you turn the corner and you have more time to wait. <laughs> is, is that a correct assessment or what? <laughs> uh, you, you know, it really depends at what part of the industry you're part of. I okay. mean, because people that are involved, uh, whether in filmmaking, as, and we're talking feature film, two-hour narratives, that's extremely competitive. We see all the content out there right now. But then you can get down to a music video production level, and that's competitive, but maybe not as much. And then you can be a local shooter, you know, doing commercials and what have you. Right. So there's a lot of facets of film production um, that 
I, I would say they're all competitive, but competitive in their own right. But trying just to write a movie, shoot a movie, get it distributed and make money from it, it's it's, it's very, very tough. So um, you asked me how I got into it. I, I went into school and, uh, you know, it took a it took quite a few to believe it or not. Uh, even though I'm shooting these films, I'm actually still in film school uh, with the interruptions with my career and what have you and other projects. So, yeah, I just got into school and I, I was taught the fundamentals. We call it film grammar. Uh, we were we were taught those uh, fundamentals of basic film production. And from there, it's just mastering uh, different aspects of that uh, production process and figuring out eventually where you fit into that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you're looking for more details, but, you know, I'm just trying to give you the Reader's Digest version. So. Yeah, no, yes. no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. it it's uh, from what, like I said, from what I know, um, you know, it's 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 a lot like the music industry and I can only compare it um, from that. I've, I've had the opportunity to attend uh, uh, Berkeley College of Music and, you know, uh, it's, it, you know, and one of the first takeaways that you realize is that, you know, 80, 83% of people um, who go to Berkeley don't graduate from Berkeley because they already get music gigs. <laughs> right. So oh, yeah. they're already broke students and then they have an opportunity to break through, yep. uh, you know, and, and I mean, I could list tons of like, oh, the drummer from this one or the guitarist from this one and all of that stuff. Uh, maybe another uh, uh, Stogie Sto Geeks episode. But, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, it, 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 it's very competitive. Um, like most other industries, online is is a buzzword that has probably mm. changed a lot when you're talking feature films you know maybe you as as a creative director have to make a decision if it's going to go on like a netflix and just uh, strictly online or if you're going to try to make the go right. in the theaters what the barrier to entry is to that and all that stuff so it's it's i'm i'm, I'm sure it's 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 pretty complicated you know but, uh, it, it's, it's complicated. And like you said, it's very competitive, um, especially when you start, uh, you have independent level films where there's not uh, a real basic standard of performance when you're dealing with talent. And this film I just uh, was hired to do in September was my first SAG film. Okay. And so when we talk about barriers of entry and requirements and having to really lay out your plan as to where that film's going, a lot of that, um, well, let me reverse that. Contracts are built around your plan. Mm -hmm. So there's certain uh, financial restrictions or required uh, compensations depending on where you plan on taking your film. So, yeah. So, again, very competitive, just like the music industry, like you um, said before. So, Tony, mm -hmm. are you speaking on uh, Ride Hard, Live Free, the uh, 2018 yeah. release? Okay. Right. I, I was going to start talking about that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, nice. You know, Life in the Hole was a great project. It was an experiment for me to work with a, a lower budget, uh, contained thriller, things like that. But that film actually earned me a job where an, uh, an investor out of Arkansas hired me to make this film for him. So, Life in the Hole, are you talking about? That one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Life in the Hole was what I financed, and then that that film earned me the uh, the job for Ride Hard, Live Free. Okay, take us through both of those in any order you want, whatever wh whatever way you want to articulate it to our audience. Okay, all right. So I'll try um, I'll try to not – hey, you know what? I'm Italian, I'm military, so I'm a little verbose. So if you got to, like, give me the signal to slow it down, please <laughs> let me know. So, But um, so my first film when I got back from Afghanistan in 2010 was titled Pitching Hope, and it was about uh, basically horseshoes, the game of horseshoes. I've always tried to approach my films with a business aspect as to things that haven't been touched. Uh, we say all stories have been told, but maybe not all subject matters within those stories. So I, sh I shot a family, a faith-based family film coming back from Afghanistan in 2010, and the production side was fine, but everything from that point forward was just a horrible experience. Unfortunately for me, um, trying to skate the line between family faith-based films while still having a realistic, like, hey, all church people aren't just polished 100% of the time. I was trying to show that we struggle as humans. Mm -hmm. That didn't resonate well with the business side of things because the faith-based community thought that film was a little too rough. Okay. And then... Uh, let's say non-faith-based viewers 
thought it was a little soft and cheesy. So I had to pick a genre and that was my failure in that. Plus I signed a distribution deal with, with a company like every, like a thousand filmmakers out there. I really didn't render a lot of money. So what pitching hope costed me was it was education. It, it taught me a lot, not only on production side, but also the financial side of distribution on the business. So <laughs> like taking all of business. those. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's how you learn, right? Trial and error. Right. For right. Sure. It, it really is. So, so taking all of those mistakes and concepts and, and just a change in my, my personal life and what have you, um, I decided to end up uh, trying to shoot uh, what we call a contained thriller. I, I wanted to uh, take a budget, half of what Pitching Hope was, um, and enable, in order to do that, I had to keep it in pretty much one location, minimal cast, minimal crew, so that we could move fast and effective. But regardless if you have a billion-dollar budget or a $1,000 budget, whether you're 20 locations or one location, story is always king. Mm. So putting myself in one room with three actors, give or take, um, challenged myself and my writer. Uh, my, my, he's my buddy. He's a real good friend. He's my co-writer, too, uh, J.G. Blodgett. Um, it forced us to create a story within these requirements um, so that – um, story-wise, it was a solid story. Subject-wise, women in peril is is a genre that is under underutilized. Um, and then also cost-wise, on a producer level, being able to do something that was affordable. So if I lose my shirt, I just lose my shirt. I don't lose my pants and my socks and my shoes. Mm -hmm. So well um, and this is what life and this is what life in the hole was for me. Um, it was to get me back in the director's seat, but also it was a business experiment and very story driven, but very, um, simplified, uh, movie making, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And this is a, the, uh, life in the hole is a psychological thriller. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, we call it psychological thriller just because, just because of the different aspects, you know, with the with the drug hallucinations and and the uh, unique style of cutting and some of the uh, certain flashbacks and things like that, it does deal specifically with human trafficking. Okay. And uh, now I my my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter was never like a victim of human trafficking, but just like every man, I'm sure with daughters that end up falling in love and moving away, I was really really jaded towards this individual guy. So I was like, okay. Man, we, we, we need to tell a story that, you know, show, shows the women that are uh, subjected to uh, uh, strong handedness. And, and in the end, they, they recover from from their from their tragedies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my co-writer, J.G. Blodgett, he's he's a he's a good church man or what have you. But again, like me, he never wanted to write Hallmark type films. So there's a lot of subtextual messaging and things like that that have. Uh, higher echelon, I, I hate to say religious overtones, but just more spiritual overtones getting you to think outside. And on top of everything else, being in school for 15 years, my first two years of film school was all production training, how to run the camera, how to run sound, how to run lights. Now that I moved into the four-year school, they've, they've, my, my focus has changed more into theory. So there's a lot of like philosophical um, metaphors and things like that in the film that are implemented. So it's very, very thoughtful, even though it may seem kind of simple, it's extremely thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Example of that is putting, putting the lead in, in a yellow dress surrounded in all of this like dark, you know, dark holes and pits and what have you. So th those were conscious decisions to try to evoke some sort of emotion and thoughts, you know, with the audience. It does. I, I hope that makes sense. I don't want to sound like a weird hippie, you know. I'm more pragmatic, but sometimes I get in that zone. So, yeah. Uh, let me ask you a question, production crew. The, the the listeners can't hear this, right? Okay. So once you say it, I will repeat it. Go ahead. Okay, so um, the way, wait a second, Tony. So what okay. we're, we're just working through is a little technical. The the production crew uh, are here of Stogie Geeks. Um, this is another element that we're adding to our interviews where 
um, they get to ask some of the uh, guests some questions. So the production crew here nice. was was reviewing the uh, trailer, and one of the questions that came up was, what was the significance of the yellow dress uh, compared to some of the surroundings um, from that, um, uh, oh, f okay. f from her experience? In relation to some of the other female characters as well. Right. Sure. Um, on the no, the on the nose answer is we were trying to show that she was kind of naive to this sort of space that was re uh, referred to as the hole. Uh, that that's that's the on the nose. You see it. She's she she was her backstory was she's kind of was a high dollar call girl that was eventually falling off from her status. Um, so now she's getting put down to like if you would the minor leagues of sorts. And so she had to get almost like retrained um, into this new kind of mentality uh, that some of these uh, lower level um, call girls go through. A lot of this was based on a, um, a documentary that we watched. I can't remember the name of it right now, but when we were doing our research on human trafficking. But to go back to your question, the yellow dress on the nose is, OK, her innocence, her brightness, um, um, again, and just to separate her, separate her from the dark, because when it, from from beginning to end, by the end of the movie, she once again uh, finds uh, reconciliation. Um, she finds a restoration of who she is. Um, she contends with a lot of her, her historical history that a lot of the time in reality brings some of these uh, victims of human trafficking um, and prostitution. A lot of them are, have been abused and hurt and have a lot of bad history with men. Um, and so this kind of helps bring kind of this healing process of sorts, if that makes sense. No, it, 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 it. You, uh, uh, production crew no, has one please, more question. Please. Tony, can, can, can you hear them? I can hear them fine. Okay. So yep. Tony, why don't you just, rep once Mark asks the question, can you repeat it for the story geeks audience and that, and, and then answer it? That'd be great. Repeat the, repeat the question. Repeat the then question. Answer. Yeah. Because the story geeks listener can't hear the stuff from, from production. There you go. Understood. Understood. Okay. What well, uh, what the message I was trying to portray with the movie um, was that though you may find yourself in a situation that seems dark, regardless of what that situation is, when you make the decision to fight through whatever you're going through, there is restoration. There is light at the tunnel, regardless, regardless of what position you may find yourself, regardless of where you are in life. That that was our deep theme, that there are things that we don't see with our own eyes that influence us from beginning to the end of our life. And that you must always, always pursue that goal, that light at the end of the tunnel. If I may, that. That specific genre and uh, subject matter, you know, should resonate well with uh, you know viewership and uh, well thought out. It, it certainly uh, the passion in the voice uh, speaks to your you know your life experience and, and where you, where you go moving forward you know with the uh, the film industry. Well appreciated. Oh, it, oh no, I pre I appreciate the feedback on that. You know, you you read some of the Amazon comments and some people are like I, I don't get it. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? You know, it, it's a film to make you think. It's right. You know, I I, um, I I was interviewed on a, another show a couple of weeks back, and they asked, well, why wasn't there – you have a rape scene in there, but why don't you show any nudity? And it's – that that would be a little more exploitative and grindhouse type, and that's not what we were trying to sell. We were trying to expose the truth with taste and, and not just try to sell it by, you know, just more not chillingly throwing a bunch of – Yeah. Yes, more story-orientated. Right, exactly. right, right. Mm -hmm. well, I think that um, you know m movies like that when you can let the listener come up to his or her, her own conclusion um, will intensify the experience of the movie for them as opposed to you know you see a, a, a woman or a male or whatever put in a situation you know potentially what the situations could be we all have vivid imaginations so you know you, you so, so you can you, you, you can intensify that right. by by tastefully doing that I, I, that's uh, you, a good technique. You know, some, yeah, you know, and that's something that we've learned as film students and people that study film from Hitchcock. That you, mm. you'll see a lot of hints of Hitchcock in there, um, just because of that very fact that you um, you you said so. 
well done. Yeah, no, uh, I think that you know uh, <clears> some <throat> of the the uh, classics um, do that. Uh, do that. Hitchcock, uh, Hitchcock, certainly one of them. Um, you know, even even some some other the uh, mainstream movies that that ha- have that that storyline where you can get into the psychological darkness. But the point of regardless of any situation that you, you're in, and you know, we face it, we live in a messed up world. There are some messed up things happening. Um, you 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 always try to figure out an out. You know, situation. Uh, sorry. Situational awareness and uh, draw back to your roots and, uh, you know, where do you go from here? Get a yeah. build on it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where could the Stogie Geeks listener find this movie, Life in the Hole? Very, very simple. Uh, it is right now on Amazon, uh, Amazon, Amazon Prime. So if anyone that has access to Amazon, it's listed on there as Life in the Hole. Um, if anybody likes uh, the platform Vimeo, uh, Vimeo is on there on video on demand. And I just found out by my aggregator, and this was actually some really good news, uh, Fandango Online just picked it up. And so that's Congrats. a major nice. accomplishment for us. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that they're still in the process of getting it digitally remastered or what have you mm. for their platform. But um, they did pick it up, and I'm very, very happy with that. So that's that's something I could pat myself on the back for on that one. So absolutely, absolutely. Now, how does that work business wise? Switching gears before we talk about the second project, how, how does that work sure. business wise? Like with, with 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 the industry. So it, it it never had the opportunity to play in theaters, correct? Or was it just no, at the local no. level? Okay. So so now with the technology, now it can play within the consumer's home, right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, so, so all, yeah. So, so how does that work? Like, how, I, I wouldn't, you know, and, and, and I'm legitimately asking because every Stogie Geeks listener, I usually turn it into somewhat of a business lesson. It's just how my brain works, right? You know, so how does that work? Like, you know, do you, do you send your trailer to different people and, and they make you an offer or do you get X amount of royalties per play? I don't need to know the financial details, just other kind of the conceptual details. Right. Yep. Right, right. The mechanics. No, yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that. Awesome. Again, I'll try to be very simple. So there's, we're going to call this the traditional model. Somebody makes a film, they take it to a film market, such as like the American film market, AFM, that's held in Santa Monica, usually around every November. And what happens there, buyers and sellers, it's not really a film festival. It's people that have films and people that buy films. Okay. The, the traditional model will kind of marry these two people together and, and, and say, hey, um, I have a film. This is how much it is. The buyer then will either, you know, hey, we'll license this for TV. We'll buy the rights outright. We can buy the rights only domestically. You keep the international. Um, people that really hustle the international <clears throat> rights then can even go down to a different level and buy per territory, which would be basically per uh, country. Mm-hmm. That's the traditional model. But this traditional model is the very thing that kind of messed me up with my first film pitching hope i got the the distribution deal and like and i'm sure you're aware of the music industry rather than the distribution company paying you a certain amount of royalties every year they acquire more cost to keep your film on their catalog so as you are incurring costs with them any money that comes in is being reimbursed to the distribution company before they come to you. So I haven't, and I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but then I'm not, I haven't seen one dime from my first film because of the distribution model kind of, a of the traditional model of, right. So yep. yeah, it's, it really is. It's, it's education. So the next, the, the new model with the new digital platforms that we have, um, people can go like filmmakers can go straight to Amazon if, if they want to. And, and people have been successful with that. Now, depending on how you list your film within Amazon per se, that specific platform, um, you can if if you submit it as free to watch for Prime members, then I think they pay you like maybe twenty cents an hour of of viewed video, so that when people come on there, they watch the film. You're getting paid per minute. That's that's one way. Another way is that 
if people that aren't prime members and have to pay the rental fee, then you you split a certain percentages between mm-hmm. you and Amazon. Now, the, the third way to do it is somewhere in between all that. You, you don't necessarily go with a distribution company, but there's a company, uh, they're called aggregators. And basically what they do is they'll take your film, they'll make sure they QC it under uh, specific um, technical requirements. They have you upload all of the various um, dimensions of your graphics and media and things like that. And then what they do is they're kind of like this hub for all of these other platforms, Amazon, Vimeo, Screenbox, Fandango Online, all these people. And they are like a hub and these, and they'll pitch your film to uh, these other places. And these other places will come and look in their catalog for that. So what the aggregator does, there's many, there's many different business formats for the aggregator. Some aggregators will say, hey, for a $1,500 fee, we'll take your film and make it available to all the online platforms. The aggregator I'm with, Film Hub, they don't charge $1 to do any of this, but you end up paying them 20% of your sales on the back end. Gotcha. So for me, not having to front <clears throat> cash per se are good. There's other aggregators that say that they can, they will get your film in front of Netflix for an for like a $900 fee. But there's no guarantee that Netflix will pick it up. They'll just get it in front of the eyes that make those decisions. So there's all these variations when it comes to getting your film specific on these online platforms. I'll be honest with you right now. I'm, I'm happy with Film Hub, but I'm not picking up as many platforms that I, I want because they're dealing with other films. They just can't talk about my film. And so now I'm trying, now I'm learning the aggregator part. Like, do I have to reach out to the companies they're already working with to be seen? Mm -hmm. Because they're not just showing my film, they're showing everybody's film. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to get lost in, in the, uh, in, in the list of films that they represent. So I hope that makes sense to you. To me, it makes perfect sense. It's, 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 uh, it's. The aggr- it seems to me that y- you need to position yourself when you like with businesses. I always talk about you know you need to focus on building your assets so that you're better positioned within the marketplace. That that's you know, I outside of Story Geeks, I have an advertising <clears throat> agency, so that that's what we do. Oh, okay, right. So so so, so you absolutely understand that concept that oh, you I, can have a product store. Yeah. But if you don't have an audience, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Walmart. It doesn't if matter. You don't know it's Walmart, It doesn't matter, right? It exactly. sounds like it sounds like let's let's peel this back so that the Story Geeks listener could kind of understand the format. They go to this meeting, similar to our IPCPR. Right. Hey, we have a target audience. We have all these retailers who sell cigars all around nation, world, whichever categorized, right? They want your new product to come out. They want information about your new product. Here's the form that, that we deliver it in. Yep. By the way, if you do business with this distributor, he or she has 10, 15, 20 cigar lines behind them. They can get you into 10, 15, 20 more shops. Right. Here's their commission structure, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and, and then it moves that way. So, I, yeah. So, it, 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 it's pretty – I think I did a good job. What do you think? Absolutely. And I, I know our uh, – <laughs> Our Stokey Geeks view- viewership, you know, we have uh, some very intelligent listeners, and uh, you certainly want to reach out to all different forums and, and, and see where it goes. Uh, podcast and, uh, Sto- you know, Stogie and uh, cigar-related forums uh, as well. You know, hopefully it plays well for you. And we're curious at home, what, uh, what are you smoking currently? Bring it back to uh, cigars. Oh, uh, you, you, you know, like right now today, I, I guess um – uh, Gilberto Olivia mm. uh, passed away a couple of days ago. Yes. So I'm having Olivia G right now. Just you know, and well just pay respect to him. And, well played. And I, I I love his cigars. Um, but yeah, I I I mostly favor Nicaraguan tobacco. Mm-hmm. Uh, Me too. I uh, as I you, you know, <laughs> I I know you guys aren't necessarily asking about how I got started smoking cigars. No, we are going to get there. Smoking, oh, we, we are oh, going to get there. <laughs> We, we, we uh, from my agenda, right, just so the production crew and the listeners know, we're going to get into the how you got started with cigars and all about Tony's World of Cigars, and then we're going to oh, go, okay. and then we're going to end with your 2018 project. How's that oh, okay. sound? Does that sound enough. good? 
No, yeah, yeah. It's a great interview. Good. It's going to be a great good. interview. <laughs> so, speaking of Gilberto Oliva, I had one this morning nice. to pay homage. That's what I was smoking with when I came into the studio Excellent. this morning. It's one of those things. So, so yeah, the, the Oliva series is, 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 is amazing. Um, I myself like Nicaraguan tobacco. So, let's, let, let's, uh, how'd you get started with that? Um, you, you know, the truth of the matter is, is when I, so when I was in Afghanistan, you know, there were different organizations sending us cigars. So, you know, we, we'd all want to feel like, oh, right. Good, tough guys after a good patrol, you know, or firefighter or whatever. And we'd go back and we'd smoke some cigars. Um, so I got, I, I've always dabbled in them here and there. I actually had a cigar buddy in basic training, uh, teach me about real cigar use. Uh, we, we had a conversation. He's like, oh, I smoke cigars. Oh, what do you smoke? And I told him, I smoke Swisher Sweets. And he just looked at me with disgust and insult. And that weekend. <laughs> Fall with an open do hand. Do you know no. why? <laughs> do you know why now, Tony? Or not? Well, I, do, I, I do now. You know, yes. I do now. Right, right, so yes. he, yeah, he took me to a humidor and schooled me up. And my first real cigar was an El Rey de Mundo. Um, mm. And we had coffee. We smoked cigars and we talked. And from that point, that planted the seed. But when I got back in 2010... Uh, my wife's a CNA, and we went to one of her patients' house for a, a party, and a gentleman there gave me a cigar, and I really started getting into it. But the tobacco beginning was a little tough for me because I didn't understand, uh, you know, medium body, full body, yep. full flavor. So I ended up getting with a local hum uh, cigar lounge here in Vegas, mm. and they put me on to the Isla de Sol. Oh, yeah. Um, that's and, and you know that's that's Nicaraguan to my, uh, tobacco, Sumatra leaf wrapper that makes it sweet. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's also fermented with coffee beans. It's yep. not like coffee infused. That it's, was my original introduction stick right the, there. Well played. Le, you know, uh, uh, Drew Estate yep. is. I know who it is. I know. <laughs> I'm excited. <Right? laughs> He's sitting on my seat. <laughs> uh, uh, Drew Estate is a. Um, They've done a, 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 a very well job at creating a culture of incubating new, what I dub and what the industry dubs as well. It's not a Joe Zemperism, but, you know, golfable is, but, but um, premium tobacco. Right. Which, right. as opposed to some of the Swisher Sweets, uh, some of the stuff um, was a machine-made product. That's the whole FDA going back and forth and all of that stuff now. But yeah, the um, a lot of uh, smokers haven't owned a retail shop and and worked in one uh, as well, and being within the industry for the past eighteen years at some facet. Uh, there, uh, the Isla del Sol is a great entry level stick for someone who um, wants to get into some premium tobacco products. Especially, sure. you know, you can't grab the biggest one, even though. A novice says, well, the Gordo is only 80 cents more than the Robusto, so let me get more of a stick and let me get yep. more of a tobacco. No, 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 no. no. The, the, there is a difference with the sizes and all of that stuff there. So you started with Isla del right. Sol. You fell in love with, with, with the concept of cigars. Absolutely. Yep. I, fell in, I fell in love with the culture. With, with, um, and I don't know if you call it culture or what have you. Oh, I it's a culture, I fell in love with sir. the fact that, <laughs> that you, could, you could sit down with a stranger from a different economic class, with a different job, with a different political view. I mean, you, you could, this thing that you sit down with just brings people together. And, and the truth of the matter is, it is legitimately relaxing yes you know it's not like cigarette chain smokers or anything like that it is it is a legitimate i don't even want to call it a vice because it's not a vice it's a lifestyle it's a legitimate lifestyle passion. that it's brings passion. legitimate that's a passion yes and and a culture that that just i think unifies people it, it really it really really unifies people so i smoking easily they sold i hooked up with another couple another cigar guy here on my street and he just kind of Along the way, he started busting my chops a little bit as to why do you keep smoking that? Yep. You know, he's breaking my chops. <laughs> so it, it got it got me to push uh, push a little bit more and experiment a little bit more, and then mixing different coffees, and then like we were talking about rum and things like that, just beginning to broaden my palate, broaden my understanding, broaden the combinations to when I smoke cigars. You know, I mean, I'd rather smoke with people. But I'm also a smoker that will just go out and back and just if it's a long day, 
let me just go have a smoke and contemplate life. That's so, it. Mm. Mm. well played. Well, well, well played. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's great for an outsider to have the same unsolicited sentiment as some of our insider interviews who Absolutely. say, you know, okay, I own the cigar company and I love the unification and I love the camaraderie and I love the, it, it really is a barrier that there is no barrier. When you sit down with, with, with a fellow cigar smoker, um, things, certain things don't come into play. Race, uh, preference, um, as long as you don't talk about politics, sex, and religion, right? Or sometimes sports, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you know, as, as, as you know, and, 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 and you sit down with someone because you have a common interest in, you know, I I say this because there are a lot of Stogie Geeks listeners out there who uh, purchase online and don't get to their local retail cigar shop. And let me tell you something: there's nothing wrong. With having your bodega, that's a garage, Spanish, right? <laughs> like I call right. them bodegas. Yep. That is a Joeism. Like, oh, you smoke cigars <laughs> only? You're, you're La Bodega, right? There's actually a band called La Bodega. But anyway, right? So, you know, you, 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 if you go to your local shop, you really get a beat and path as to, you know, um, getting to know other people's stories outside of the cigars. Very you welcoming. Know? Time stands still wherever you are. Yeah. In the garage or in the lounge, yep, it's uh, it's a great great forum to uh, bring people together that normally you know probably wouldn't walk the same uh, path, you know. Yep. If there's any story geeks Absolutely. listeners who are psychiatrists, I apologize, but this is a way better therapy than <laughs> sitting on a long couch, and uh, you know because you meet so many new people. Like uh, we we could probably do a story geek segment. Just on the people that we've met, we we've Phenomenal. done some of the some of the barriers that yep. that cigars have opened up for us, you know, telling our stories. But you know, it, it it's like it's amazing when you go down to your local retail shop and you get a chance to kind of fraternize with the guys or guys and gals now, and mm-hmm. and, and, and and you know, you, you, it's amazing. You you get a beat on your town. You certainly hear the news, <laughs> whatever, right. good, bad, or indifferent. You know, and, and and you get to talk about the different plans. Oh, I like that. Oh, I never had that. Let me try that. You know, and and that still goes on even. I'm a filmmaker. What are you doing on Tuesday? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm a filmmaker. You know, well, I'm a comedian. I think I'm funny. Right? <laughs> you yep. know, absolutely. So, what other types of cigars do you like to smoke now that you've graduated? I'm using your friend's word, not mine. Right. <laughs> right. All right. 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 No. No. That's very good. I. You, you know. I. I'm, I. I I, I'm going to go ahead and just talk free, and then you guys bring my chops tonight. No, I am, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, am, I am a Rocky Patel fan. Now, okay. you, go, you go to some of the, the boutique shops around here, and they're like, well, you know, Rocky's okay, but, you know, sometimes he only has one farm. And, <laughs> you know, I don't I – don't, it's like Rocky he was my first love. I just I just smoked recently the Sincato, and, uh, if I'm saying that right. Mm-hmm. And that's supposed to be like – we're not telling you what tobacco's in there, mm. but I'm telling you, I taste it and I taste a significant difference. But on the other hand, his edge, which is a Sumatra wrapper, which I favor, yep. I don't like at all. Mm-hmm. So, um, I love the I'm edge not... Candela. You know the Candela wrapper, the green one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that got me high one time. Yeah. I don't mess around with it again. I love, <laughs> I love Candela wrappers. I know people. It's pronounced Candela. No, it, it, I say it the way I want to say it. That, <laughs> That is, that is, uh, if you want, if you want to, um, it's a different experience. Oh yeah. It's great. I love them. But anyway, <laughs> so you like Rocky Patel's. Have you ever had the Gary yeah, Sheffield but... Ra- Rocky Patel? No, I have not. Yeah. Gary Sheffield. Not. He played right field for Yankees. Uh, came okay. out with his, with his stick, had the opportunity to meet him when, when he was promoting his stick and whatnot. Uh, it, 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 you know, um, a lot of celebrities now are starting to have sticks. They have the big poppy out, out here who was Boston Red Sox. They have Gary Sheffield. Okay. Uh, Camacho makes one by Mike Ditka. Ray Lewis. Yep, yeah. keep going. You have any more? Right, yeah, you uh, know, all, all yeah. these celebrities, want, you know, and again, that, that is another segment within itself. But um, when it comes to Rocky, I like the Candela Edge. Um, I do like the Edge, the Edge series. Uh, I will tell you here from a Rocky Patel story. I don't know if you know this, but I used to own a retail shop back in the early 90s. Uh, and no, I'm sorry, back in the late 90s to the early 2000s. 
99 through 2004. And um, Rocky Patel's first gamut at Cigars was, was with Indian Tobacco. And it didn't I, do... I just heard, I just heard this story, yeah, yeah. just like, uh, last week as a matter of fact. So, okay, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it didn't do well. And then I remember, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing, so if any of the story geeks listen, you're getting it wrong, right? Um, I remember when Rocky Patel was ready to launch what we know now as his Rocky Patel series, they were saying how, well, you can't name it Rocky Patel. You're not of descent, you know what I mean? And yep. he's like, no, nope, we're going to put my name on it. Then he, then he released that decade. I'm sure you had the original decades. That's my favorite yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. one. And, and, you know, I have argued with reps. <clears throat> I have argued with um, the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> I have argued with uh, some of the echelon within the company. From there, the original decades, I mean, they were so sought after here in the, in the Northeast when, when they first came out. They were available on You Can Only Buy Two. Two at a time. Oh yeah. Yep. They're only yep. available. You can only buy two. Wow. And put up. It, 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 it was a craze with the Rocky Patel, and then since then that has released. You know, like some of the other hype and whatnot. It 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 it, it has released. And in my time, cigar wise, there's only one other time that I know of, personal experience speaking, where we can only sell two. And that was the Opus X. The Opus X, yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So so it was one of those things where, you know, like, Bench wow. Marks. Like, you know, and, and, and so, you know, a lot of people might not like Rockies now if they're serious cigar smokers or if they're premium smokers because, you know, it, it, he, he built the machine, right? And now I look mm-hmm. at it from a business perspective. There's no discredit towards Rocky. There's no disrespect, by the way. The views and opinions of this show re- reflect <laughs> me, right? They reflect <laughs> me, the co-host of Story Geeks, not Story Geeks, its management and or its staff, okay? <laughs> There's my official disclaimer. I totally However, can appreciate that. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> However, right, you, you know, you, you can't blame him for building a machine. You know what I mean? When it comes to marketing. Because if you look at Drew Estate, they built a machine yep. as well. Took on a life of its own. And, yeah. Uh, it's they're breaking more. I mean, I mean you know, they, 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 oh. and, and you know something? As a business owner, okay, as a business owner who helps other business owners, and I look at that, whether you like the blends or not, whether they, they've changed blends or not, or you like the former decade and you don't like it now, or you think, well, whatever you think, it doesn't matter. He built a machine. Yep. You know what I mean? So from a business perspective, if you build a machine, you, you, you got to pay the man credit. And not for nothing, he built a machine of when Richard's first experience didn't do so hot. You know? So, you know, Rocky Patel's, uh, they, they certainly, like other sticks, they have their place. stick to drive. Certainly, uh, Tony had spoke on his uh, you know, uh, previous endeavor, and you can't, uh, you can't be jaded and... Uh, uh, downtrodden. You gotta, you gotta keep working. You gotta keep plodding along, and yeah. uh, you know, on to the next one. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Gonna be hungry, bitch. Absolutely. Have you gotten in in your section now? You're locally in Nevada, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. We're in. La- I'm in Las Vegas. Yeah. Okay, Las Vegas. Right. The Las city, Vegas, baby. The city <laughs> that never sleeps. Right. Uh, see, I could never go to Las Vegas because I would come back. Did you ever see Castaway? Yes. I would come back like Tom Hanks. Wilson. I would have beard. I'd be talking to, like, uh, objects. I would have cut-off <laughs> shorts. The sweater would be dirty and, like, be stretched. <laughs> the hat would be fray- it would be crazy, right? But anyway, um, I, have you gotten into the boutique craze? And what I mean by that, some of the, some of the um, non-classic facings. Now, I'm going to stick Rocky in that classic facing thing. Like, when I say classic, I mean... Ashton, Arturo Fluente, Help Padron. Me Out, Padron, like all the ones that have, uh, right. La, uh, La Aurora, they've all been there for years. Um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, have you gotten into any of the kind of boutique stuff there? And what's the culture like there at your local shop? Okay. Um, so if my definition of boutique doesn't align with yours, please correct me because this does show the kind of. Uh, I'll call, I don't want to call myself an amateur, but, you know, I'm new. I've been smoking four or five years. Um, Boutique-wise, my ingestion, my shopping for cigars, I usually have a rule, um, and this rule was taught to me by a cigar mentor of mine. When I go into any shop, I, where I'm in California, Nevada, I was in New Mexico a few months back, I always ask, hey, 
what's your boutique? Mm -hmm. Show me. I, I like something Nicaraguan. Mm -hmm. Show me something boutique Nicaraguan that uh, you you could uh, suggest to me. So I go on. It's like shopping for ice cream. I love pecan praline. I do. <laughs> but when I when I go to an ice cream shop, I don't always order pecan praline unless I'm just tired. And I'm like, look, I just know what I want. Yep. But normally, if I if I'm if I'm there for two sticks or so, I'll go with a boutique. Like, show me what you got. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably saying the brand wrong. Ta I never can say it right. Tatawahi. Tatawahi. Um, I, I, I usually, I usually go with them, mm -hmm. I, uh, man, so many boutique brands. I, I, can I can't, come back I can't and, recall. Like, you can come back and yeah, think of we, it as, cause, cause I am putting you on the spot, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. but the Tatuajes, uh, you know, they came out at the same time as Viaje and we know I can't go without a story geek episode without right. mentioning either Tatuaje or Viaje <laughs> because they right. are, they are. Uh, they, they are in the category of a boutique and, and, and how I personally categorize it is you have people who are newer on the market and believe it or not now the years keep adding up but mm -hmm. 12 years yep. 12 years or so as opposed to the tradition 100 change years or 50 years like Romeo and Julieta right. classic facing right. uh, Ashton right. classic facing uh, classic facing Camacho Right, classic. Right, yep. it's there. Right, yep. it's not as old, but you know, it. it you have classic faces. But Tatuaje, when they came on board, you know, some some ten so years ago. Please, I don't need any hate, hate email. You know, Pete's been around for so many years. You know what I mean? How could you? You know, right. but yeah, it, the the they make some some really good stuff for sure. You know, would you would you would you say that Liga Pravada is boutique? Uh, very good. Woo! Well played, Tone. There you go. Oh, I because, think, you know, Tone has been doing this all morning. Based on your definition, what have you, but because Liga Pravada, Papa's Fritas, mm. uh, was it nice. the Fat Rat, all those, I, I, those are my, hey, it's time to have a treat. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? But I definitely like those brands. So. Yeah. Um, very good question. Um, do you want to answer first? I put them in that that upper echelon boutique, and uh, certainly they've they've you know, they've gained tremendous legs everywhere, you know, all around. You know, so they're they're right on that right on that edge of uh, creeping outside of the boutique end. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, uh, it wouldn't be a Stogie episode if I didn't mention uh, Christoph. Christoph's one of those that you know they're on that they're on the upper echelon uh, boutique list that they're branching out too. They're everywhere, and um, you you hit you just. Just hit one for me. Christoph is another one of my uh, go-to's. Also, Christoph. So yeah, yeah, they they they've yeah. done a good job with uh, with 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 um here in the Northeast. My opinion, right? They were part of that original. I don't want to say revolution, but it really is a revolution. Marketing deployment one hundred and one. Yeah, That's, uh, it's yeah. it's you know the these boutique cigars, um, whether we categorize them as boutique or not. They've put a dent into the classic facings. Yes. And yep. the and, and, and the only way that I can articulate that to the Stogie Geeks listener is to just say imitation is the perfect form of flatter, uh, flattery. Perfect. So in other words, yep. Romeo and Julieta never had a Nicaraguan cigar, right? Never. And then all of a sudden, now they get into the there Nicaraguan market. Right. And right. we could we could go on oh, for, for yeah. days talking about that. Yep. Right? Uh Avo. Mm -hmm. Right, Avo. Right, the the past two, two, three years, maybe two, two years, three years, with the Synchro series. Right, yep. boom, there you go. So, you know, when these boutique cigars, what they do, Tony, my opinion, and maybe Jody's opinion, you can either back me up or tell me no, whichever. Yep. Right, so <laughs> I love this forum. Right, yeah. Um, and of course, the Stogie Stogie Geeks listener can always email Joe H or Joe D at StogieGeeks.com. We keep the conversation going. We can post up on Facebook or any of our um, social media platforms. But that being said, you know, you you want to, you know, their the classic facings are going against their grain to try to keep up. Getting to your question about the Liga Pravada, right? I'm speaking from my experience and my interpretation of the development of the Liga series, right? Um, from my experience, uh, they work, and I'm sure I am going to get an email from Joe over from Drew Estate <laughs> saying, spot on, or kid, you need some more practice. Either <laughs> way, it's fine, right? Um, you know, with the Liga, 
and you have Drew Estate. You know, they originally created that. It was uh, released at a wedding. I know that because I've had actually one of the cigars from the original wedding yep. from there. Um, there and then you know the, the Drew Estate has its own following. Drew Estate has its own culture like following. Culture. Yep. Uh, Drew Estate has its own marketing methodology, but they've also entered into the celebratory treat yourself cigar market. Yes. Right? Am I delivering this okay? Yep. Right? Good. I'm doing good, right? Ba bang Sounds on. good and, so far. And, 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 <laughs> and so with that, we now enjoy the Liga series and you have the pig, a flying pig, uh, feral, the yep. feral, oh, yeah. and, and, and you have all the other stuff there. So that being said, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a business. And when you're in the business there, you have to be on your toes. Always. You can't just say, hey, we, we're Drew Estate. We make super awesome cigars for the entry-level <clears> person. And no, they, they want to capture because the experienced cigar smoker wouldn't hang on the Isla del Sol forever. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. So they came up with something that is a better grade tobacco quality, totally different cigar, totally different methodology. And so that being said, you know, you, you have all of the different exchanges that the business entails. But. And there's always moving parts, certainly post uh, cigar rock star Steve Saka. You know, that league is still uh, stands on its own. And it's in that, I, I like to call it the uh, championship cigar uh, realm. You know, certainly it's it's one of those a little bit higher priced uh, you reach for. Mm -hmm. You know, special occasion. Maybe you don't grab for uh, three in a day at the lounge. You want one. You're going to grab one and taste the beverage. Call it a day. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Any other boutiques you've been, you've been getting into, Tony, or what? Um, would you guys consider CAO boutiques, or are they um, – because um, I'm a big CAO fan across the board with those guys, well, too. Well, uh, actually, so. we could it's – interesting, it's an interesting discussion because they've gone through some transition as well. Um, some people have sure. left the company and have started their own separate entity. Right. Uh, I, have, I have reviewed some of those sticks uh, as well um, from, uh, from there. Um, let's just stay on the subject. What do you like from CAO? Oh my gosh. Uh, naming all those individual ones. Can I just, I'm going to sound like an adolescent. Just give me two. Can I just, just give like, me two, Tony. Uh, like, like, I like the Brazilian one. I definitely like the Brazilian one. The La Brazilian, And then also, yeah. uh, How about that and, Amazon uh, what was the basin? one with the American? The Americana. Yeah. The Americana. The yeah. Americana. Yep. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know that's my patriotism, but you know what? Uh, that was a real good cigar. The thing that I know, though, that I, I can stand on with a little bit of confidence when it comes to what I like and that I'm not just chasing brands. A lot of the time, again, I'm, I'm smoking things that are suggested by the shop owners, not knowing the real disposition of the cigar. And sometimes when I'll, I'll have a cigar not knowing what it's made of, I'm like, yeah. And then I'll have another one. Like, oh, I really like it. And then later on, I figure out what I've been smoking. I'm like, yeah, I really do like Nicaraguan, and I'm not a great fan of Dominican. But I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one out that I feel is boutique, and you guys please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it is a Dominican tobacco. It's uh the the Amadeus. It's like a white label Amadeus Connecticut wrapper, mm. and that is a beautiful Oof. cigar for the morning with your coffee. It doesn't blow your palate out. It's good to warm up with in the morning, and I, I just love it. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. So yeah, see, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that brand. I'm slightly familiar with it. It's um, every cigar has its place. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, like you said, yeah, it's a lighter cigar. It's Dominican. But you know something? I like it with X, coffee, or I like it with rum, or I Certain like it in the morning. The yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. In the morning. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Exactly. What yeah. I'm hearing, Tony, is too, uh, you know, you're reaffirming what we, uh, you know, we try and beat home here on uh, So Geeks, Joe and I, Paul, you know, we've, we've had this discussion many times, but, uh, um, you know, that education process, you know, you're doing all the, uh, doing all the right things, certainly, you know, I've been smoking six, seven years, but doing the right things, asking the uh, humidor attendant, the shops, the feedback, uh, and certainly, you know, and you have your, you have your experience with that cigar right then and there, however, you choose to revisit second or third, maybe, you know, you garner some of that uh, education and intelligence behind the cigar and, and the feedback, and it makes for a more enjoyable experience. And now you're an educated consumer, mm -hmm. you know, speaking of Joe's uh, business end of it. That's, and that's ultimately the, uh, the goal, I feel. You know, you're enjoying the stick more. You're educated. 
you're also going to in part educate friends uh, as well and keep it going. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it's funny that you use that term education. You know, I'm just, you know, I, I have never, I've always tried to protect myself, my reputation and the things I think about myself of not trying just to be a poser or, or that guy who's at a bachelor party walking around with a stick and he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, I, I try, if I'm going to spend money and buy cigars, if I'm going to smoke cigars, if I'm going to talk about cigars, I really, really want to know what I'm, what, what I'm doing and, and be able to at least a little bit articulate, you know, again, the culture we're talking about. I have, I have an older Italian gentleman friend. He's actually from back East too. I believe he's uh, from uh, Brooklyn. Um, he's out here now, retired school teacher. He actually did a little mini class with me. And it, this was like one of the best classes. And if people want to, I would suggest this class when it comes to wanting to really get to a level of understanding the the different taste and the the nodes and things of cigars it, it was it was a packet where you had a little robusto cigar and then with that packet came individual like almost cigarellos mm -hmm. which was just wrapped with the binder yep. and then you just smoke the wrapper by itself and then the different fillers and you really have to sit there and focus pay attention on to it oh, the, yeah. those those individual elements and analyze it and talk about it and what part of region is this from i mean it was very very analytical and then at the end you smoke the whole cigar and then all of a sudden now you can taste all these different nuances that you were tasting by smoking those individual elements i know I, I don't i don't expect everybody to do that but for me wanting to really really understand that you know i don't want to say i want to keep up with everybody go oh i taste leather and a little nut and there's some marshmallow but i really i really want to but but on the other hand i do want to taste those individual nuances right and and that is how i start that and i'm not perfect by any means but this is how i started to educate myself yep. um on more in-depth levels of cigar consumption did so. you remember the name of the seminar or no like was uh, it? You know, it, it, it wasn't a seminar. It was just they, there. There's a brand out there that sells these little like blending uh, packets kits. in this. It's, exactly. Yeah, exactly. it's called a. It, it, it's called a blending kit. Was it red? Was the box red? Oh, uh, yellow. It's kind of like a mustard yellow label, if I remember oh, right. The Jose so, Blanco, uh, Blanco, maybe. No, Jose Blanco is a uh, is a one. I guess it's Toro size, and then you, you smoke through. The cigars all connected. Uh, the La Aurora series. Um, That's a red box. I believe. Is 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 a red box that yeah. actually separates it into that. But yeah, I'm sure there's a bunch of them uh, over there. Yeah, um, that, those sure. are fun. Those are absolutely may, fun. I wonder if the La Aurora's. I'm, I'll probably email Willie find out if they were originally yellow. Um, because they could have switched from yellow to red. Absolutely different. Because it sounds like he's too. in there. We, we've actually done that. <clears throat> I've actually, um, when I started co-hosting the show. Here with Joe, uh, I've actually taken myself through the blending kit, and I've actually wrote it in my little black book. I travel around with a little black book, and I'm prepared to do a show on that as as a filler show. Yep. Uh, taking it through, and I've actually pulled out. It's, it's a fun process. It, man. It, it, it really it, is. It's a really interesting process. So you know, uh, check with your local retail tobacconist. I I think they do them on a, like every other year basis because. You know, as as time progresses, you know, people. Oh, is that the same guy we did last year? Yeah, right. I might not go or whatever, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, you owe it to yourself to kind of educate yourself because you know, if if you enjoy premium tobacco, um, it is an educational process. And yeah, you know? it's fun to geek out about it. You know, we do it every uh, do it every week on the show. But, yeah, you know, yeah. We, you know, we do right. it probably a little bit more than uh, most. We you know, we basically do it every day, but it's uh. You know, it's uh, it's an ongoing process, man. It, you know, and uh, just like yourself with the filmmaking, it's a learning process all the way through. Every every movie's going to be you know you're going to tighten it up in uh, in various points. And I'm curious to uh, to hear your take on this new movie as well. Yes, before we get oh. to the new movie and wrap up the interview, I have one more cigar question for you. Not to please, put you please. not to put you on the spot, and there's no judgment, <laughs> and and I will help yeah, you. I will help you out with the pronunciation if you if you or the label if you describe it and whatnot. I might not get the blends and blends right because I don't speak Spanish, but anyway, right? Um, we have a rating here on Stogie Geeks. One of the okay. two highest ratings is Fight Chuck Norris, meaning that if you were if you had to stick. In order for you to finish the stick, you would have to fight Chuck Norris for it. And then we have another. Oh, 
And then we have another rating. <laughs> then we have another rating called the Oasis, meaning you know you're all by yourself. World doesn't exist. What cigar would be your unicorn cigar nice. or your Oasis or your Fight Chuck Norris? If you could have one more cigar, and and this was it, you have one more cigar. What would it be? Deathbed cigar. Where if we you going? need time to think about it, we can do the movie part, and then you got to end with that. But you got to remind me because sometimes I forget and say, "Okay, next episode," and, and there you go. But yeah, I I I know right now because I have two in my humidor right now. Give it to us. And uh, <laughs> oh, and they've been sitting because I wait nice. for special occasions. There you go. I like it. Um, I, I is there I a story behind the, these cigars too? I, you know, uh, I went to a lounge. Okay. I brought my wife to uh, for our anniversary. The guy g- gifted me one because mm-hmm. it was our anniversary, and that's. Um, I believe it's uh, the Padron nineteen twenty four. Yep. Is that is that the right? Nineteen twenty six. Nineteen twenty six. Yep. Yep. Oh, I say, oh, okay. So, there you go. You're yeah, right there. You're right there. You it. Give it take a few so, years. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Yep. Yep. You, you know, it would be the Padron, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, that the reason is is listen. And maybe you guys could suggest something now or later or what have you. But um, I'm always looking for that $5 smoke that just tastes great. I think Brickhouse is relatively close to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, when you're paying $15, $20 a stick, most, I guess with Padron I can speak for at least, yep. you're, you're tasting the quality. Mm. It's not just the taste, but it's the draw. It's the burn. It's the smoke. You're – if you're smoking a legitimate twenty dollars cigar, you're you're getting that twenty dollar experience. You get lost you know in it. I mean? You get lost in it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And 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 the, you don't fight the draw. The taste doesn't burn you. The smoke is just right. I mean, everything is just primo. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, that would have to be my. Yeah, I'm ready to throw down with Chuck Norris to get to the Oasis. You, you know? need help, so, Tony. Call me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> natural or <laughs> Maduro? <laughs> Was it natural or Maduro? Do you know? Maduro, Maduro, Maduro. There you go. Well played. Yeah. 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 That, that's... I, I, like, I like, like sweet. My palate is very sweet. I drink this Arono because it's sweet. Franchelico, it's sweet. Rum, sweet. You know, Maduro, sweet. I just, I have a sweet pal. I'm a sweet guy. Yeah. Yeah, like I've got a Christmas hat on today. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you and I uh, seem to have a similar palate. I, I, I like rum. Uh, I, I love coffee. Um, I, I love D. Serrano can turn any cigar. That's my. That's been my go-to. Uh, as D, of late. Yeah. D. Serrano can turn any cigar into a treat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like in the wine. You know how they give you the the aerator. You know the aerator. You know what yep. I'm talking about. Yep. You know it can turn any five dollar bottle of wine into a ten dollar <laughs> bottle of wine, or any ten dollar bottle of wine into a twenty dollar bottle of wine. Definitely worth your fifteen dollars for the aerator, yep. right? If you don't lose a little screen in it, good last year, good ten years, right? Best fifteen bucks you ever spent because any any bottle of wine is is good, and you. I know uh, I uh, drink a lot of wine, um, uh, almost daily. Yep. But I like I like wine. Um, a little sacrament yeah. with or without cigars, and um, I've done a whole series of of wine pairing, and we're we're due for one soon. I got some more. Yep. Some some, some a little holiday thing. special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let's right? go. <laughs> you know, but um, you know, I, I I I always do it if it's new to me. I always try it without the aerator yep. first, and then I do a little aerator and, and experiment a little bit with that. And that, and and I think that that you know, it, it, again, it's like that educational journey. That's what I love about spirits. That's what I love about craft beer. That's what I love about wine. That's what I love about cigars. It's that really self journey of for you to find and take time out. It doesn't necessarily have to be with a cigar in hand all the time, but just take time out of this crazy world. You know what I mean? You you turn on the news and you're like, oh my god, did that just happen? Yeah, that did just happen. It's on the news. Oh, you know. And 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 if you're like me and you're Italian and you're animated, you're like, oh my god, there's got to be another planet out there with with smarter people. But anyway, <laughs> right? You know. But you know, I, I I love that process. So, but yeah, the 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 Padron. Getting back to your fight, Chuck Norris. Um, it, 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 it really does take you back, you know, it, it really does take, take you back. I'll PM you over on Facebook, some, some, some other smokes that, uh, are not in that price range, but you know, you, you, you might want to seek out, 
You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah for absolutely. Sure. I mean, this is for sure. Because I don't want to start. I don't want to start an email it. war. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but 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 the, there really are a lot of uh, cigars out there that can be um, that take you back. And 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 if you listen to some 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 Stogie Geeks episodes, either from the past or I will say within the future, um, when right after your segment we do a uh, Stogies of the Week uh, segment. And some of those, I say, it just takes me back. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like it just, it just like you have to stop what you're doing and just thoroughly and we, and enjoy we try the cigar. And, trying to compass uh, all, all price points, classic versus boutique, the whole thing. We, you know, we really try and uh, get the full gamut uh, and appreciation, and uh, hopefully it resonates well with the listeners as well. They, you know, they're they're smoking the you know, the full full gamut as well along with this. So, you have a website where people can track you, find you, stay in touch with you. Absolutely, I do. Uh, the website is uh, thenextshot.tv. Okay. So, again, thenextshot.tv. Nice. Thenextshot.tv. Production cool. if you could throw that in our notes for our social media, that'd be greatly appreciated. Now, before we let you go, you have a new show. Okay. You, you, you have a, a, a new project that's coming out in 2018. Ride Hard, Live Free. Ride Hard, Live Free. I like yes. it. Yep. Was this like a motorcycle thing? What is it? Take us through it. Okay, yeah. It's uh, Sons of Anarchy meets Mad Max. There's my elevator pitch really? right there. So, I'm intrigued. Yeah, so it, it takes place, the story takes place um, basically in the near future. If, if you could imagine America basically just collapsing and all the guns and ammo either being confiscated or used. Oh, you mean like currently then, as we're talking? <laughs> <laughs> so if you can imagine Hillary Clinton being elected president and then four uh, years after uh, that. Uh, no, we don't talk politics, no. sex, or religion on Stuggy Geeks. <laughs> I was talking, I was kidding. That could easy. Okay, no, but uh But no, if yeah, so it's a near future, the government's collapsed, guns, ammo are gone. Um, you put a little girl in this world, and that the, the film follows this little girl as she navigates this southern desert, the southern Nevada desert of, of this kind of war torn uh, country of where we've collapsed. Mm -hmm. And basically what the film is about, she ends up um, getting locked into a, an abandoned RV where she di discovers a, a gun and an ammo. Mm -hmm. She's chased into this by a bunch of biker clans that um, don't realize what's in there. And then the film is this like cat and mouse chase with them with with all of them discovering, oh wow, there's a gun. Oh wow, there's there's ammunition. There's a cache here, and nobody has seen or heard of these things for over 50 years. And so now it becomes a cat and mouse chase with them trying to get her out and her fighting them off and um, what have you. What I'm very proud about with this specific film is this is my my first SAG film. This is my first. I've worked with talented actors for a lot of years. This is the first time that I've used like. SAG name talent, Emilio Rivera, who starred in Sons of Anarchy. He'll be in the upcoming Mayan show. Um, he did a cameo appearance for us. R.A. Mihailov, who played Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw 3. Uh, we got Tim Corselli, who is in Full Metal Jacket. Um, uh, uh, just, just an array of uh, actors with professional talent that, you know, I was able to test my uh, acting chops on. And uh, I. I think they would say I did well. We got it done, you know, with a lot of complications <laughs> as that happens. Right, right. But it's it's shaping to be a really nice film. So, when is it expected to release? Uh, we're going to say mid 2018. I'm probably on the last two minutes of the of the rough cut right now. After we get the rough cut in, color uh, correcting and and design only takes about a month or so while someone else is working on music. So we're shooting for like mid 2018. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tony, also, you know, Barstow, California zone. Um, you've got a couple uh, military installations nearby, the Marine Corps Logistics Base, uh, the uh, Fort Irwin National Training Center. I'm wondering, two part, kind of a two part question. That, along with several celebrities, are uh, uh, Barstow zone. I'm, I'm wondering if that, along with the fact that, you know, the rich mining history of uh, Barstow, if you have. Any projects you're working on, you're contemplating moving forward, tying in some of those uh, celebrities, maybe some of that that rich mining history, if you've uh, contemplated any of that moving forward? 
I, I can't I can't say necessarily that I've contemplated movies per se that deal with uh, the the mining or or what have you. Um, Emilio Rivera was a fantastic actor to work with. He's just so hard work. You think that some of these Hollywood actors, you hear these horror stories of of like how prima donna they are and how high maintenance they are. Uh, Emilio Rivera was so hard working. You would think it was his first film he've ever done. The way he just worked and performed for me. So I would um, I, dealing with the Southwest Desert. I would I would maybe contemplate maybe doing some type of western. I've I've never done a western. I've never written a western, but maybe we could. The, the only mining the only mining film I've ever thought about was a zombie uh, mining film. If you go back to the old days, <laughs> old miner. He's cracking around trying to get coal or gold or something and hit something in the rocks and it spurts out on him and he's a zombie, you know, and then it just spreads. But outside of that, uh, a real a real story uh, around that, not not really right now, but um, also my, with my, that rich uh, military history in, you know, in your uh, your own home neck of the woods, your current military as well. Um, I, have you been approached by uh, uh, aspiring actors come from that military background that certainly appreciate your your service to the country that that want to get on board. Uh yeah, you you know what once once in a while, you know every time it's 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 kind of fun, you know, at work when people find out that I I'm doing films and and now I'm built, you know, obviously in the military being built into a network of of just a couple hundred folks here and there with different units. So everyone's got a good idea and uh everybody would like just to jump in and be an extra the, the the cool thing is with this ride hard live free I, I I did have a female soldier uh, who served with me and her first name was Zyra and I, I don't know how cool this is but her first name was Zyra and she's she's such a young hard charging female soldier that you know she keeps up with the guys no problem um, I I said you know what I'm going to name my lead character after your first name just because mm, one solid. the name is cool. But she's she's a solid soldier, so you, you know I definitely nice. wanted to exemplify that young, strong female type character. Awesome, well, well done, Tom. Awesome, a little bit of homework for you, sir. Oh. If you could time it about a month before time. you're about to launch or whatever, please get back in our rotation. You know, like okay. if you know you have a launch, and, and email uh, Joe H at Story Geeks or Sam or or contact us like you did before. And uh, okay. we'll get you in rotation to, to, to build some hype around the, the release for your movie. And, Absolutely. And, and, and if you have a trailer there before, you can email okay. us pre and we'll, we'll play the trailer and all of that stuff too. We'd like to hear from you. And and and, oh, you know, absolutely, and, and, and do that there. Now, I'm not one of those, what are they? They're not called arbiters. Arbiter, what are they called? What's the, what's the aggregator? A, aggregator. I'm not a film aggregator. <laughs> right, right. But right. you know, we 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 do have uh, a a uh, loyal audience here who I know that will definitely check out some of your movies and some uh, of your absolutely. work and stuff like that. And and I think it'd be pretty cool to, you know, uh, for for us to you know when it gets released, interview you again. Here at first, yeah. We'll we'll talk some more cigars. We hopefully the trailer will obviously be done by then. We can play the trailer, chat about cigars. Maybe you can add to your list of boutiques as long as you stay away from oh, those. I'm, I, it's I, the I'll tell you what, I, 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 I'll be ready. I'll have a list like right nice. next to me of all the different things. You know, like oh yeah, this one, this one. Right, <laughs> so. absolutely. Uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you, sir. You know, Merry Christmas to you, gentlemen. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate thank you. It. it was a it was a privilege and an honor. Thank you for your service. Privilege to talk to you, ladies and gentlemen. That was Tony Mendoza. Check him out. Go to our wiki page, and you'll be able to check out all of his work. And stay tuned, because he's got some more stuff coming. Coming up next is the Sticks of the Week. We'll be right back.